And open up your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. As we think about special gift that was given to us 2,000 years ago, probably more than likely not during this time of the season, but we can still reflect upon it, can't we? We can still take time and remember a Savior that was born to us. A question does come up, why was such a special present, special gift needed? Why was it given? The reality is, if we leave it up to man and how he wants to get to heaven, usually the rationale with him is, if my good outweighs my bad, then I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to do enough good things to go to heaven. And that's why, as a minister, it, it is a struggle at times because people might come to me that are unbelievers and want to give me gifts, want to give me things. Why? So that they can go to heaven. <laughs> so, you know, I don't, I don't want to be part of that per se. I would rather tell them how they can know for sure that they're going to heaven rather than them taking a guess as to whether or not they've done enough good to get to heaven because the reality is Ephesians tells us you cannot do enough good to go to heaven. You can't do it. Christianity teaches the opposite of what the world teaches. Christianity says the moment I commit my first sin, I'm lost, I'm dying, I'm headed for hell, and there's nothing I personally can do to resolve that. Because God is light and in him is no darkness. And he's never going to have any part of your darkness. So God has to look at me as if I've, really what he, what he looks at me is through the life of Christ and his righteousness that has not been imputed upon me or given to me when I came to know the Lord as my personal Savior. That's what he has to see. God symbol symbolically clothes us with righteousness. Back in the days when the Bible was written, when they had a priest that was here offering sacrifices for everybody, that priest was not sinless either, was he? As a matter of fact, if you remember before he would go in to offer all these sacrifices, he would have to cleanse himself <coughs> because he was not good enough. You cannot cleanse yourself. The priest could not cleanse himself. We need to take away the old garments because the old garments are nasty and gross and we need to replace them with new. How does that happen? Through a Savior which was born to us. Now you would say, Pastor Matt, why do we spend so much time harping on the point of salvation through faith? Why, why do we spend so much time on that? You, you work that into so many sermons. It seems like we could be talking on a completely different subject, and somehow, some way, you bring it in there. Why is that? Why would we do that? Because it's the most important thing in your life. Miss out on what Christ has done. Miss out on what God has done. And you'll miss out for eternity. 
This is an important thing. It's how you get salvation. When we come to Galatians in chapter 4, we see a contrast with a servant and a son. Why be a servant when you can be a son? Good question, right? What would you choose if there was, if you were in a household and the man had everything and you had a choice to make, would you choose to simply be his servant or would you choose to be his son? Become an heir of everything. What's the choice? Remember the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son? He knew that he deserved to be a servant, right? He knew he had taken the inheritance that was his, went out and blew the whole thing. It's gone. His inheritance is diminished. There's none left. When he came back to the household, he asked to be a servant, didn't he? What did the father do? Take him in as his servant son accepted him into the family so you know what folks you do not deserve to be a son not a single one of us do does we don't deserve it we deserve to be a servant we deserve to have nothing but i want you to know that god accepts you so in this passage of scripture Galatians in chapter 4. The illustration is of an infant son. And if, you're, if you know what a bar mitzvah is. Back in the days, on your 12th birthday, you would have that. And it meant that you were a man now, right? It meant you were responsible really for yourself. That's what it really meant. You're no longer under control of the whole system that is set up. You are responsible for for yourself. You're no longer underneath everybody. So when we come to verse number one, let's look at it in that light. He says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. So you see the child there, right? And this is in reference, really, to a, a, a king or to someone that just has a lot of money, a lot of things. And eventually, he's going to become the heir of everything. He's going to have control of all of those things. And what does it say about him? When he is a child, there's no difference between him and the servant, is there? As a matter of fact, in the following verse, in verse number 2, Galatians 4 and verse number 2, but is under tutors and governors until the appointed time of the Father. He still has to answer to the slaves, to the servants, to other people, even though eventually he is going to be heir of everything. The tutors and governors, their guardians, their stewards, Certain slaves would have that role, but you would see that it says, until the time appointed of the father. The day is coming where the child will be mature, where the child will start no longer having to answer to all of those people. Verse number three, even so, when we were children, we're in bondage under the element of the world. So what does it say about us? We were under, at one point in time, bondage to the law, really, the elements of of the world. And you know what that is today, unbelievers, you know what they're in bondage to? The world. 
And they are. You talk about a land, and we, we talk about it in Sunday school, and we talk about it at different times. You talk about a land that has so much, it's America. I'd venture to say that we're, we have so much that people don't even have to work anymore. <laughs> There's a lot of people that don't even work, right? And, and it's annoying to go out to places right now because you, you just... There's not enough people to do what needs to be done. You can't get your goods from the ports. They need, what, 80,000 truck drivers to get the goods from where it's at to your local grocery store and that. And you go to the airports right now, and guess what? They canceled all kinds of flights yesterday. People spent Christmas in the airport because they, they couldn't get workers into work because they might have COVID or whatever. And I can't get bus drivers to go out and pick up kids and take them to school. And so we got to tell parents, sorry, you have no bus today because I got no one to drive your bus we are a land of plenty way more than we ever need and you know what it's making people in this America especially it's making them a slave of this world and this system and really if you don't know the Lord as your personal savior you're a slave of this world all you have to look forward in life is to get everything you can get there's a bumper sticker that I used to see when I was growing up. He who has the most toys wins. That's the world, isn't it? That's all they have to look forward to. And you know what? In the end, if all you've done is tried to gain all the toys you can get, you're going to find out that all of life is vanity. It's empty. It's nothing. It means nothing. Because you're still going to come to the end of your life. And if all you've concerned yourself is about yourself, which is what the world does, guess what? You're probably going to be a lonely, old, I don't know what the word coot is. I hope it's not a bad word, but you'll be a lonely, old coot, right? No one will be around you. You'll be mad at everybody. You'll hate everybody, and they'll all hate you. I've seen many, many, many people in that situation. All they had lots of things. They're a slave to this world. But look at this. Verse number four. But when the fullness of time was come, when I was in, I don't know, the youth group, as a teenager, this is one of the verses that I had to memorize. I remember it. The Word of Life stuff. I didn't understand the verse. I just memorized it. And I and I memorized it in a way that I still remember the verse today because of how I did it so I could remember it. But when the fullness of time was, got, was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. That's how I would say it out loud in my head, kind of made like the little... Uh, wrote of it so that I could remember it. I wish I would have known what it meant back in that day. I know what it means now. But when the fullness of time was come. Well, what did we see at the very beginning of Galatians in chapter 4? We saw a child who was the heir of great things. He became a man and became the heir finally, right? He no longer had to answer to people and slaves and things. That was his fullness of time. But spiritual think, spiritually thinking now, because it's an illustration, it's a comparison, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. Everything revolves around God and his timing. Before... The fullness of time before the Savior was sent to us. You had the Old Testament and you had the law. And all the people lived in bondage to that. That was God working with man at that time to prove to him that he could not be perfect. That's what the Old Testament law is about, really. And even the Pharisees, they thought they were perfect, but they weren't. They sinned. They would tell you they didn't, but they did. And if you're honest with yourself, you know you sin. 
And, and thank God that we don't have the Old Testament to try to live up to. Because you know what? If the fullness of time, if it never came, we would have to live to the Old Testament standards. And guess what? We're all headed to hell. But the fullness of time had come. What happened when the fullness of time came? God's timing. God sent forth his son. So if God is sending his son, what does that make him? That is God sending a part of himself. That is God sending God to this earth. So we see what he is. He's 100% God. So when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. And then it says this, made of a woman. What does that make him? Makes a man. 100% <laughs> God, 100% man. God sent forth his son, made of a woman. And the amazing miracle of the whole thing. And only God can do this kind of thing. How is it, according all the way back to Genesis, how is it that I am a sinner today? It's because Eve sinned, right? She ate of the apple. How dare she do such a thing? Now, wasn't Eve... She did sin, but that's not how well, I get my old sin nature. That's not how sin is passed on. It's Adam. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. Adam, not Eve. Can't blame your mom for all the bad things you do. <laughs> you know, when kids act up, <coughs> what do parents do? Your son. <laughs> well, you know what? The woman probably could say that, right? It's you. You're the one that passed on this to him. She's right. It's passed by the man. Well, who is Jesus' earthly dad? <laughs> well, sure, it's Joseph, but is it really? No. What was placed inside of Mary was placed there by God. It breaks that old sin nature. And so he came into this world as God and man. And then it says, made, I don't even know where it's at, but it says made under the law. Right? Made of a woman, made under the law. He was made under the law and he lived the law. Did you know that you do not need a savior to be born for you to go to heaven? You don't need it. And it's already happened, but even if it didn't happen, you still wouldn't need it to go to heaven. If you could be 100% perfect and never sin. But you can't do it, can you? That is the only thing that satisfies God. Perfectness. But guess what? Each and every one of you have a father, an earthly father, don't you? And by that fact alone, sin is passed upon you. So because you can't be perfect, then you do need the Savior who had no earthly father to live the perfect sinless life and do what no priest could do. Remember me talking about the priests? Well, you know what a priest's role was? You know what a priest did back in the days? He went in and he'd offer a sacrifice for you. And when he was done with that, you know what he had to do? He'd go in and he'd have to offer a sacrifice for your neighbor. You know what he did after that? He'd have to go in and offer a sacrifice for the next guy. He spent his whole day offering sacrifices. 
over and over and over and over again. And every year he offered one for the nation Israel. But Christ came and he lived up to the standards of God because he is God. He was perfect. He was sinless. And then look at what it says, verse number five. To redeem them that were under the law. Well, you, you know what redemption is, right? Redeem. Yeah, you buy back. For the Jew in that day, when you use the word redeem, what would come to their mind is something different than what comes to my mind. When, 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 when redemption comes to my mind, my mind goes back to the old days of Kmart. When you'd put something on layaway, <laughs> you'd go, you'd go in and spend, you know, here's 20 bucks, here's 20 bucks, here's 20 bucks. And they'd keep marking it off till you paid for the whole thing. And then they, once you paid for the whole thing and it was yours, then they would stamp it redeemed, right? You got it. It's yours. It's redeemed. To the Jew in that day, it took them to the slave trade. And what it would reference would be a guy that would go in. He would buy a slave, that was the redemption part, and then set him free. No longer in slavery. So if you're redeemed from the law, that is God purchasing you out of slavery and setting you free. Because you're no longer under the law. You know what? The rest of the world, if you're not a believer, you are under the law. And you need, to leave a, you need to live a perfect, sinless life to go to heaven. Or you got to pay the penalty for your sins. But guess what? Christ redeemed you by paying the penalty himself. And he did something that no other priest could do. He offered a sacrifice that was finally acceptable to God. God accepted his sacrifice because he was perfect, sinless, and it was acceptable to God. The only one that could do it. And that's why when we talk about God looking at you and seeing Christ's righteousness, that's what happens when you accept him as your personal Savior. His blood washes you clean. His righteousness is given to you, and that's what he sees. So let's keep going down through here. To redeem them that were under the law, verse number five, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. You see, you as a believer... No longer have to be a slave to the Old Testament law. You no longer have to be a slave or under the governors or under the rulers. You become a member of Christ's family. When you accept him as your personal savior. And you can live in freedom. Doesn't mean you live in sin. <laughs> you actually can live free of sin. Because the Holy Spirit has been given to you. And he can help you with that. Now look what it says, verse number six. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his sons into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. When you become to know the Lord as your personal Savior, you receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into your life. You know what the Holy Spirit does and makes you do? You cry out, Daddy. That's Abba, Father. That is the most... Uh, uh, that, that term in the Bible it, it has a great depth in meaning and caring. And it's what a little child does when he screams for his daddy. When he says he loves his daddy. You know what little kids are like with their fathers. If it's a good father, right? They think their father is the biggest and the baddest. The coolest. They think their daddy can beat up your daddy. And that's what we do. We cry, Abba, Father. We look to him for everything to sustain us, 
spiritually and physically. Verse number seven. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. See, if you're no longer a servant, you are an heir of the person that has everything. Do you think Jeff Bezos is rich? Yeah. Yeah, by our standards on earth, yeah, he is. But guess what? Nothing compared to God. And when you come to know the Lord as your personal Savior, you're an heir of God, not Jeff Bezos. You're an heir of all things. Eternal. And look who it's through. Christ Jesus. The baby that was born to us 2,000 years ago. The baby that gave himself and died on the cross for your sins. It's through him. Then verse number 8. This is interesting. How be it then? In other words, he gets to the point. He sets all this up. He says, listen, you, you were a slave. You're bought out of slavery. You've been given your freedom. And you become an heir of the richest being of God. So what in the world are you doing? How be it? How in the world can this happen? What are people doing? How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no God. So here you are. You didn't know God. You weren't a believer. You were under the law. You're, you're under all this whole system. You, you, you're, you're fighting every day for everything you can get. But now, so you came from that system where you were a slave. Now... After that, ye have known God. So after you become a believer, now you know God. You've accepted him as your personal Savior. You believe that Christ came and did all those things. Righteousness has been imputed to you. Now that you know God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? How in the world... Do you go and, and release yourself from that whole system and then just step right back into that system where you're back into bondage? How do you do it? I don't know. <laughs> but that's what many, many, many people do, right? They just step right in to that bondage Again, the Judaizers back in those days, by the way, they, they, they came back along. So what would happen is the apostles were going out. They were starting churches. They were telling everybody about what Christ did. They were saying you no longer need the Old Testament law. You don't need to be into that kind of bondage. You have freedom through Christ. You're a joint heir with Christ. And then the Judaizers, after Paul would leave town... They would come into the church and they'd say, okay, yeah, it's nice and good. And yes, Christ is the Messiah. But, but guess what? We still have the Old Testament and you still need to do those things. You still need to offer up sacrifices. And by the way, in the book of Hebrews, we see that happening all the time, right? That's what the people in Hebrews were doing. They went back to offering sacrifices for their sins. Why? Christ already offered the final sacrifice. You don't need to go back to that stuff. You're free. You're no longer in bondage. Don't go back to the works. You were a slave. Somebody freed you and allowed you to become part of an amazing rich family. Why become a slave again? So he says in verse number 10, you observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. You know what all this stuff on this world is? Vanity. 
I'm afraid you didn't understand what Christ came and did. I'm afraid that Christmas time rolls around and you say, oh, yeah, 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 I, I know what Christ did. I know about the babe that was laid in the manger. Yeah, we sing all these Christmas songs. And by the way, many of the Christmas songs that you hear on the radio and you hear going through the stores, amazing theology in them. And sometimes I hear these worldly singers that don't know anything about who Christ really is. They sing these amazing songs. <laughs> And those songs are giving glory to God because they, they were written in amazing ways. And in the midst of all of that going on, when we should be concentrating on the Messiah, when we should be concentrating on the Savior that was given to us, we're running around doing what the world has to offer. And we're subjecting ourselves to just being slaves. And that's what the world does. Don't be a slave to this world and what the world offers and what the world's trying to do. Because guess who the author of this world is? Satan. He's the one that's controlling all those things. He's the one that's pushing those advertisements in your face wanting you to have the latest and greatest things instead of thinking upon Christ and what Christ has done. And we get in this rat race of this world and it leads to nowhere. Christ came to this world. When we come to know him as our personal savior, he frees us from the bondage of that slavery, from what this world is offering, and he gives you freedom. Don't go back to your bondage and your sins and all the things that we used to be involved with. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. Fill your heart with the Holy Spirit. He will give you peace on this earth. He will give you the joy that the world is desperately searching for. And if we go back to the rat race, we'll never find that peace. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do just thank you for this day. We thank you for this lesson that you've given to us here in Galatians in chapter 4. We once were slaves, born really into this world as slaves. Slaves to bondage and sin. But you gave us your son. You gave us Emmanuel, God with us. He died on the cross for our sins. And I pray for true believers that have come to know you as their Savior. I pray that we would keep the correct things in focus. That the things of this world will grow strangely dim as we concentrate on you. As we fill ourselves with your Spirit. May we concentrate on what Christ did. What he means in our life. And then those that don't know you as their Savior. Those that are running around in this world just in this rat race, trying to gain a foothold, trying to climb the ladder, trying to get more and more and more. Never finding fulfillment. I pray, Lord, that we can be a witness to them, that we can show Christ in us, that they would give themselves to you. That they would not have to be a slave to this world themselves. Father, we ask these things in your name. Amen. At this time... Open up your handles to 192. Marty, we shall explain what she's going to sing. 184. From, oh, yeah, one, one, 184. 184. We'll, we'll, we'll go to the right one. Oh, yeah, I still have that. Up. Yeah, there we go. 184. <laughs> That's the correct one. Thank you, Steph. And uh, Marty's going to sing a verse for us, and then we'll all sing the first and last stanza. So I'm just going to sing in German. So.